Hey, this is Jim Lee, Chief Creative Officer and Publisher at DC Comics. I want to welcome you guys to DC at Home Day 1, technically Day 3 of San Diego Comic-Con at Home. Um, but before we get started, let me just thank all the great, amazing people at Comic-Con for putting this together. Putting together a virtual convention takes a ton of work, and we're very thrilled and honored to be part of this. We think it's an amazing solution to this horrible crisis that's afflicting the world. And I'll tell you, this would have been my 34th consecutive Comic-Con. And um, so I guess I'm keeping the streak alive, but virtually. All right, we've got DC at home, day one. Kicking it off, we've got an amazing panel about DC superheroes, led by the Superman Group editor, Jamie Rich. And he's brought together a cavalcade of amazing DC creators. We've got Brian Michael Bendis, Ryan Sook, Kelly Sudakonik, Vida Ayala, Mariko Tamaki, Mikhail Janine, Clayton Henry, the two Toms, Tom King and Tom Taylor. See if you can tell the two apart and Ram V. So without further ado, take it away, Jamie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Comic-Con at Home. This is the DC Superheroes panel. We have a lot of great folks to talk to today, so I want to get them in here as fast as possible. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Jamie S. Rich, and I'm a group editor at DC Comics. And first, let's bring in uh, Tom Taylor, who is get, dialing in from Australia, currently writing Ooh. Deceased for us, uh, as well as other things, Suicide Squad. Uh, how are you doing today, Tom? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's it's about 3.30 a.m. here, and I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for you. So just another, like, wild Monday night for you is what you're telling us. That's right, yeah. <laughs> All right. Next, bring in Ram V, who is currently working on Justice League Dark, as well as some upcoming uh, issues of Catwoman. Ram, you're calling us from England, if, uh, if I'm correct. Yes, and it's uh, 7.30 in the evening, so it's not too bad here. <laughs> it's not as bad as 3.30 in the morning in Australia. All right, and we have two guys coming in who are working together on our Strange Adventures comic book, the team behind Mr. Miracle uh, and Sheriff of Babylon, Tom King and Mitch Gerrards. Wait, I don't get my own introduction. I have to share it. What is this? Uh -huh. What's crap? <laughs> that is terrible. I mean, at least I got, I got my toms right, because I have to mix you two up, just like the internet. <laughs> um, and Mitch, so you wouldn't be lonely as the, the only artist on the panel. We also have Clayton Henry, who is just oh. beginning to stint on Batman Superman, being written by Josh Lampton. Hi, Clayton. Hey, are masks optional? <laughs> <laughs> However you want to do it. And then <laughs> Kelly Sudakonik, uh, the writer of Aquaman and uh, just one of the best people I know. Welcome, Kelly Sue. I have best people you know. Yay. I mean, the competition here is not also great. on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very low bar. <laughs> so, Kelly Sue, I just actually got in the mail a copy of Aquaman 61, which should be hitting stores very soon here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in Aquaman right now? Uh, it's really hard for me to remember what is happening in what issue, actually. Uh, so, it really is, right? Like, what is out now? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I feel uh, uh, grossly unprepared for that question. Um, I, I will... Th this arc is kind of is coming to a head coming to a, a a big finale i think we're i think that's end of act two that's uh in your hands and um uh so you know the act two is where our, our heroes are always the lowest of the low um uh and uh and actually i i <laughs> actually as though this is you know rare i i I'm really proud of this, you guys. Like, I like it. I think. <laughs> I know. Um, no, you don't but... sound like a writer. I don't think writers are proud of what they do. <laughs> yeah. I'm also a woman, so um, <laughs> I'm completely unqualified. But uh, but yet I keep showing up. Um, but the uh, 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 poor Tom. I did. You did not. <laughs> Sorry. Which Tom? Hopefully, to me. Yeah, uh, uh, um, but no, but I have that thing where um, I am not great at at long storylines. Um, uh, I, I think my strongest issues are actually one shots, um, and I'm pretty comfortable with a, a, a 
a five issue arc, but I will start to lose the thread. Um, like self-contained five issue arcs are, are very are a very comfortable place for me. But like as you start expanding into really really long runs, um, it, I find it very difficult. Uh, uh, and I think I actually called um, Brian K. Vaughn at one point early in my career and was like you have this reputation for having everything planned out really long term in great detail. How the hell do you do that? And he was like, oh no, that's a lie. Um, uh, <laughs> nobody likes a nervous pilot. Um, so he, he was like, you know, I know I'm, I'm he pro I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but uh, he was telling me that like, no, he has, he has guideposts, which I think we all have, like he knows he's going for this point and it, but doesn't know how he's going to get there either, which was a great, um, a great relief to me. But anyway, this is a lot, much longer answer than anyone wanted. But, um, but I, I feel like in Aquaman, this might be the first time in my career with the exception of uh, creator owned work, where I feel like the, uh, the cumulative, the, the the story arcs have been cumulative in a way where I'm keeping, I'm managing to keep all the threads together, and that's very exciting. What about you, Tom King? You don't seem to do anything less than twelve issues. Your strange adventure <laughs> issues. <laughs> Tell me about it. How do you keep the plot going? No, I, I, I'm with Kelly Sue. I, I, one, one shots to me are are easier to get in my head. The, the, the longer it is, the harder it is, especially when you get the three act structure and where to break it, and especially the middle of Act Two. So congratulations for ending Act Two. I feel yeah. like that's like the hardest part, that like last half of act two when you're kind of like, the, the character's gonna end up floating for too long if you do it wrong. I'm just and, and yeah, and people are, uh, are, you know, they're reading it episodically in issues and like they, and especially in this environment, you don't wanna bum them out too much, right? But you gotta keep the, but you have to keep the stakes up, right? So. No. Yeah, well, no, I, right. I think one of the reasons I like working with Tom is that he writes these 12 issue uh, stories for me, but every script always feels like almost like it's a self-contained thing or maybe in a, maybe not self-contained but each each issue has its own gimmick to it rather than just feeling like part two of 12. so yeah um, that's the trick of writing episodically right you have to have 22 pages that feel like a a, a meal and a complete story on them in, in and of itself but then it also has to have a reason for you to come back and build so it can also be read as part of a, a larger piece. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's like, almost the joy of the medium. Uh, it's it's a solving produce. aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, as the other artist on the panel, Clayton, how do you feel about that? Or how, how many issues are you currently working on in terms of like Batman, Superman, and, and the length of the story? I had a three issue arc and a little bit of uh, the annual. Well, I did 12 pages of an annual. So I've done three full issues, starting with issue nine. And, uh, oh man, the schedule uh, the, or the shipping has gotten all screwed up. So <laughs> I think issue 10 is supposed to come out in a few weeks. And, uh, yeah, but all, all of those are done. Um, I had, I mean, that was, that was the, that was like maybe the, the highlight of my career was, uh, getting to draw, uh, Superman. Yeah, Batman's in it too. But I was, I was <laughs> really, really excited. <laughs> Can you tell us really, I was really excited about the Superman, uh, about drawing Superman because um, I, I was uh, I was first introduced to American superhero comics uh, through Super Friends growing up. Um, my, my, I was born in Jamaica, and you know, my parents, uh, my family moved here when I was uh, three. And yeah, when I saw you know when I finally saw like Superman on on. Uh, in a cartoon, and I don't know for some reason that character stood out more than all of the others. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe it's the immigrant thing. I I, I I don't know, but um, yeah. So so I used to draw him like all the time, and um, I, I remember drawing him all the time anyway when I was like a little kid. So uh, I'm still getting to know the DC universe right now, but uh, that was that was like the goal. It was like when when I started uh, drawing for DC. Well, when I started drawing a, a Black Lightning a few years ago, uh, when Jim Chadwick had, had asked me to draw it, um, that that's, that was my goal. I'm like, okay, well now I want to, to do good enough work to where I can draw Superman day in, day out. And getting to do this was just, um, 
was just really, really great. Josh uh, writes a really fun script. Josh uh, Williamson. Um, lots of stuff blowing up. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to give away too much. I can't give away too uh, too much, really. Because, uh, but uh, 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 Ultra Hugh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, what do I want? Uh, God, what's the character? A Flaming Soul character. Uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I'm having a brain fart. All of a sudden. Ultra Human Knight? No, 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 not my dogs can fight me. Roxy has some guesses. Sorry, Atomic Skull. Oh, uh, Atomic. Yeah, he, um, well, he dies in the beginning. That's not giving away too much because the name of the issue is Who Killed Atomic Skull? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's right there on the cover. I'm like, okay, we could have at least waited for people to open the cover, but no, it's right there on the cover. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's about, you know, the mystery of, uh, and, and that was one of. Uh, super, I'm still getting into the DC universe, like I said. So I think that was one of Superman's first villains was Atomic Skull. So it's about the mystery of why did he die and who killed him. And uh, since the second issue is coming out pretty soon, I don't know how much I can talk about. But right. I'm done with that, and I'm already on to my next project. And I don't even know if I can say what it's about. I, I think I can, but you'll, you'll let me know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Actually. <laughs> Tom Taylor, what are you? you get well, well if, if you don't know, then then who's who's steering this ship? <laughs> Tom Taylor, I mean. <laughs> yeah, tell them, Clayton. That's fine. If I'm in charge, just just speak. <laughs> and it seems you're just wiping out all of these characters. How does it feel to take the icons and just destroy them? And Tom could probably answer this as well. He's known for it. Destroy icons. Is it a bad fun. sign that a bird just flew into my window? Oh, really? <laughs> yes, that's literally a bad sign. <laughs> well, for the bird. <laughs> yeah. um, what was the question? Killing icons. <laughs> and then a bird died, and we all felt sad. <laughs> And now the comedy stylings of Tom Taylor. Uh, <laughs> you you did, right now, like at a comedy club. the chair thing. <laughs> um, yeah, look, we're killing. So we're killing Deadshot. That's the big one we're doing. But that's like actually in continuity. So I kill a lot of characters outside continuity, and it's okay because it doesn't have much of a bearing on anything. But this time, yeah, we're killing him, and and DC kind of announced it. What was, I love Deadshot. That's in Suicide. <laughs> Suicide Squad, yeah. Um, issue ten. He's finally living up to his name. Right? Issue nine, Terrible. yeah. Yeah, dead shot, shot dead. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's awful. And we have this, you know, it's we have this great. Oh my god, this is going to be a huge moment. And we're like, no, we're just announcing it two months beforehand. I'm like, okay, we'll do that too. <laughs> and Ron, uh, we're running out of time. We're running out of time here, so I want to make sure we get a quick one in from Rom. How how are things going on Justice League Dark? What's happening over there? Yeah, we're uh, kind of uh, at the culmination of the uh, of the arc that uh, James set up with his run with with Upside Down Man. Uh, so all that craziness is uh, coming to bear, and uh, our heroes are going in for their last sort of hurrah against this big uh, villain that's been building for close to 20 issues. Um, well, that part's already written. Uh, and so I'm kind of uh, in an interesting place where um, my editor on that book, Alex, has just said, so what do you want to do? Pick a new team, you know, start a, start a new adventure. Uh, it's kind of exciting to be in that place where you've got that blank page and you go like, oh, cool. I get to bring in all the weird stuff that I've always wanted to bring into this corner of the DCU. So uh, that's where that is. Awesome. Well, that this went super quick, guys. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in. Uh, thanks for coming, all of you out there, to this DC superhero sections of Comic-Con at home. And uh, stick around for more. Thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome back to part two of Comic-Con at Home's DC superheroes panel. Got another great lineup for you. Want to welcome to the panel first Mariko Tamaki, the new writer on Wonder Woman and the Eisner nominated writer of Harley Quinn Breaking Glass. How you doing, Mariko? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. And then we have Mikhail Hanin, your partner on those issues of Wonder Woman, the artist calling in from Spain. Hi. How are you doing? Good. 
And next we have writer Via Ayala, who is working on the Swamp Thing Halloween Spectacular coming out this October, as well as some other stuff for DC. And then finally, last but not least, we have Ryan Sook, artist of Legion of Superheroes, and Brian Michael Bendis, writer of Legion of Superheroes, as well as Superman, Young Justice, and Action Comics, because he's just not busy enough at this time. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today in the virtual world. Uh, it's uh, Comic-Con for everyone out there now watching. They can watch us anywhere this year. Um, Brian, I'll start with you. You actually have you know, some experience working with a giant cast. How, tell us what's going on with Legion of Superheroes these days and how you balance all these characters. Well, there's giant cast and then there's Legion of Superheroes. It's a completely different ballpark i mean a big cast and like when we are in x-men it's still about six lead x-men and there's a lot of people running around the background but with uh uh legion of superheroes we have like uh three dozen lead characters each one of them could lead the book lead the team uh has enough story to like anchor a whole book so it for us it's almost like this giant ensemble uh, uh, we have to put focus on every character as often as possible. And we keep adding new characters as well. So um, Ryan is a perfect partner for this. It, it, like anything we come up with, he he adds, it's all additive and all this comes up with new stuff. So it's just a matter of, uh, for us, making sure that every character gets it to do. We have this awesome two-part a 44 artist Legion jam coming up with issues eight and nine that, that is about focusing on each character uh, going around the whole room, making sure everyone knows who everybody is and what they're capable of. So Ryan, it's, you, it's the craziest thing. Ryan, how do you keep them all straight when you're having to like go through the script and figure out who goes where and who belongs in the background? And I don't, I have to redraw so much, so much stuff. No, uh, <laughs> Brian's a great writer. He writes exactly who needs to be there. And uh, I just do my best to sort of uh, draw them, though I do have a cheat sheet. It's four pages long of every single character and their design so that I can refer back to it. I would have thought by issue six I'd know them all, but uh, I still refer back and look and look at them again, again and again. Um, yeah, but like Brian said, it's a huge cast, and and each character is their own lead this 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 legion of artists that's coming up drawing the legion of heroes is it's super exciting. The characters have come more to life than they ever have before. Um, I got the benefit of having Mikkel draw some of them in issue four and they never looked better. And now Kevin Nolan and Art Adams and uh, Michael uh, Oming and God countless Yannick Paquette, everybody, it, it, the characters come to life in a way they haven't before and make them even more real to me. So it's, it's really fun. Speaking of Mikkel, you've also dealt with a lot of different characters in your career so far. You've done Justice League Dark, you've done Batman, you've just taken over a Wonder Woman. How do, you, how do you adjust to getting all of these different characters and keeping them straight? Well, uh, every project is really different. So uh, I think it starts uh, really with the writer uh, because now that uh, Ryan and um, Brian are talking about uh, legion of superheroes it, uh, when you start working in that project you feel so uh, the passion that they those two men are putting in the project you you can feel the that they love every every little bit of that story so uh, you feel like you just enter in that story and it's easier to to get in the mood of the of that particular character or, or with mariko we had the opportunity of working in Wonder Woman, and it's the same. It's a story that it's in her mind, and you just uh, get the vibe, and you just jump on it, and it's uh, easier to to work with so uh, great teams uh, and those people which are amazing. Uh, I guess just to continue on this thread to both Vita and Mariko, how do you go about approaching a character like Wonder Woman or a character like Swamp Thing and that has? so much history behind it. What's your approach to make it something personal and new? <laughs> it's stressful. It's super yeah. stressful. I think it's, I mean, I think it's like a, uh, you know, on the one hand, I think you're writing into such an incredible 
like existing like mythology that's already been created. And I think you have to be, you know, you have to respect and honor that and then try to think what you specifically as a writer can bring to that world. Uh, and so I try to like sort of find my lane of like what I feel passionate about and what's really interesting to me and what makes me sort of nervous or excited and, and write into that. Yeah, and, and for me, I, I try and do as much homework as possible, even for shorter things. I'm like, just give me everything that you can and I'll, I'll absorb it usually just by eating it, not by reading it. No, uh, <laughs> but I think to myself, all right, so I have all of these different interpretations of the character. What's the core? What's the, the common denominator? You know, what's the center of this Venn diagram? Um, and then I think to myself, all right, if that's who they are general, you know, that's the core of them, then, what story makes sense to put them in, um, in a more contemporary context, usually. I don't usually- Can you tell us a little bit about your Swamp Thing story then? I, am I allowed to? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was asked to, um, to write a Swamp Thing story in like a place that we had never seen Swamp Thing before. And I was like, all right, well- That's I'm easy. Always, yeah, no problem. Uh, but I'm always like, all right, well, there are two places I go to first because that's who I am. And those places are New York and Puerto Rico because I am a black and Puerto Rican and I was born in New York, uh, which is one eighth Puerto Rican. One in eight people in New York City is Puerto Rican, by the way. Uh, so, you know, I, I thought to myself, is there something that I can do to kind of bring very much what I know to Swamp Thing? And the answer was yes, because I don't think he's ever been in Puerto Rico. I could not find it. Um, and to me, for Swamp Thing in particular, and, and for characters that touch the green, um, what I find interesting is that the environment very much does change things about them, right? The core will still be who they fundamentally are, blah, blah, blah. But like literally Swamp Thing is made out of plants. So putting him into a place will change what he looks like. And I was very interested in that and also very interested in how uh, the culture of the people in Puerto Rico would interpret something like that. What does that mean to, you know, especially people descended from, you know, the Tainos that were the indigenous people there, or, you know, our, you know, children of the diaspora. What does that mean when you have this character that literally comes from the earth to you, uh, especially as a people who are super colonized, right? So, uh, yeah. So when, when, when I thought about that story, I was like, how do I make Swang Thing look cool? Uh, <laughs> and also how do I make, how do I make it so that Swamp Thing is a necessary part of the story? Uh, Brian, bouncing off of that, you have a villain coming up in Superman 25 that is coming from a different planet and coming to Earth for the first time. And you already have characters like Connor Kent, Superman, all these characters that are from different places. Do you have similar things going on in terms of like trying to figure out how they each adapt to this new environment? Yeah, it's a couple things. Well, we're, because it's a Superman book, it's all about how it relates to Clark or how Clark relates to whatever new thing is in front of him. And we thought, you know, we have a Superman 25. It's a big double-sized anniversary issue. What a grand opportunity to uh, put a new toy in the Superman toy box and create a villain. Uh, we thought, wouldn't it be great to create a villain whose mindset is so different from anything that he has seen on earth or anything that superman relates to like this is a person that there's no part uh that that superman can relate to so he has to like back up and come up with a different set of ways to deal with this not just that well i'll punch it in the face and see how that goes let's let's take it a step back and see how we can uh handle uh some uh, an adversary of ignorance we don't we don't understand each other let's figure it out and we have no way to communicate so um, not mentally, not physically, let's figure out a way to communicate. So I thought that would be an interesting way to um, celebrate Superman. Like wh what does he bring to the table that uh, no other superhero can bring? And this villain br brings that out in him. Uh, Mariko, you've created a new villain as well coming up in Wonder Woman. You want to tell us a little bit about Liar Liar? Yeah, actually, um, and I have to say, uh, it's a uh, liar, liar is me, a combination of me and Paul Kaminsky uh, and uh, Brittany, who uh, are my editors. It's a, always a very much a group uh, project, uh, getting um, working on these things. So yeah, we wanted to do a character that was, you know, like a younger female villain, 
Uh, and I think a lot of the the sort of the theme of this of the theme of the book is is about the sort of definition of uh, villains and heroes. And I think that one of the things DC does really well is this kind of like blurred line between who is you know who is heroic and who is villainous, and and what that means in like the sort of ever shifting context of the DC universe. So we wanted to work on somebody who is you know, at their core sort of doing villainous things, uh, but has a complex history that ex explains those things. And yeah, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the comic is also about trust and about the sort of how we want to read people and how we like want to see people in our lives and, and how they are. Well, we have a few minutes left. I want to actually touch base with Mikkel and Ryan and similar questions, but in terms of how do you design characters. I wanted to ask Mikkel how you went about designing Liar Liar and Ryan, you've got this new character of the Gold Lantern coming up in Legion of Superheroes. I'd like to know kind of what went into the designs behind that. Uh, so Mikkel? Well, it was uh, really fun uh, to work on this character. It was uh, totally new for me, uh, the, uh, for everyone, but for me, especially because I didn't know anything about her. And I saw a, a couple uh, designs, early designs from Riley uh, Rosmo, and they were, uh, uh, the vibe was there, and, and I, I took this uh, and tried to to give her uh, like a very innocent uh, point uh, and mix it with uh, that villainously uh, thing, like creepy, and and we had the, the bunny there too. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a bunny, that's true, there is a bunny. Yeah. I have a, a bunny and I... Uh, I didn't know that! What? Yeah, uh, and uh, <laughs> I have two bunnies actually and they were supposed to be boys, but one of them had uh, five uh, springs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now one of them is, is called Mulani uh, because of, yes! of, the, <laughs> of nice. the character. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Ryan, how, what can you tell us about Gold Lantern? Gold Lantern is, uh, he's kind of become, he's such a great character. He's the epitome of all the lanterns, you know? I mean, when, when Jeff Johns was bringing out all the spectrum uh, a few years ago and the, the amazing sort of scope that the lanterns bring, it's broad, but Gold Lantern refines it all down into this one character. It's not a core, it's a guy, you know? It's this one character and he brings legitimacy to all these emotions being encapsulated in one thing. And it's part of the Legion universe and in a way that I think is totally inseparable from it. But designing him was a lot like designing any of the other Legion characters. We could take elements for, this is a thousand years in the future. There's nothing withheld, right? So we, we, we have all those elements of the lanterns and all the history that's there, but to push it a thousand years in the future, make it recognizable, but really, pull it as far as we can into the future and let him be a character that's not bound by the history, but brings that history into an expression that's totally new in the future. That was kind of the idea about designing him and making him gold, at least from, from Brian's uh, perspective, it was just, is that a gold lantern somewhere in there? You know, it starts like that and it's this germ <laughs> of an idea, but, but all of a sudden it's like, yeah, that is a gold lantern. Oh wait, we gotta know the gold lantern. And when you have characters that evolve and grow as the story and the, and the characters are growing, boy, it really is exciting to design a character like that because you, you start with such a blank slate and then you can just refine it as we go forward in the story. It's really fun. Cool. Well, thanks well, again. We're Andy. very excited about that taking off, by the way, too. We are. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, that's all right. I was, I was just getting there, the, the, wrap, the virtual wrap it up. So wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you guys all again for joining us today. Uh, I think everyone out there appreciates it. And now everyone out there that is watching, thanks for coming to Comic-Con at Home's DC Superheroes panel. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right, next up, we have a very cool panel, DC for Young Readers. It's being led by our VP and executive editor for our Young Reader program, Michelle Wells. And she's brought together the creative talents on two upcoming books, talking about um, Lois Lane and the Friendship Challenge is Grace Ellis and Brittany Williams. Talking about Swamp Thing Twin Branches, we have Maggie Stiefvater and Morgan Bean. Take it away, Michelle. 
Hello, and welcome to Comic-Con at Home. My name is Michelle Wells, and I'm Vice President and Executive Editor, DC Books for Young Readers. Just want to tell you a little bit about our line. Our DC graphic novels for kids feature original, out-of-continuity stories by superstar authors and unique artists that tell stories about your favorite DC characters, such as Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and all the rest, from a middle-grade perspective. These stories are ideally suited for readers ages 8 to 12 and tell stories that help kids understand the world around them through fun, funny, and flawed superheroes. Fun fact, graphic novels are a great way to get your kids to read more and are a proven tool to help struggling readers and to challenge advanced readers through vocabulary paired with visual context clues. Add in stories that focus on exciting moments in the life of a superhero and it's a match no kid can resist. So if your kid is a huge superhero fan, or if you are looking for a way to share your favorite characters with your children, these books are it. One of our super fun upcoming titles is Lois Lane and the Friendship Challenge, which tells the story of a young Lois Lane who is really learning about what the meaning of true friendship is and setting her on the path of who she will become in the future. Here to talk more about the book is author Grace Ellis and artist Brittany Williams. Hi. Hi, Grace. Hi, Brittany. Okay. Grace, tell us a little bit about Brittany. Ah, this is Brittany Williams. She is an artist. She is unbelievable, first of all. Second of all, she if think of a property that you love, she has worked on it. Um, every everything from Archie, stuff for dynamite, IDW, others. She lives in, I want to say, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Is the I'm everywhere. Yes, right, right. That's why there was a question. Um, question mark. Oh, she's the co-creator and artist of Goldie Vance for Boom Studios. Unbelievable book. Um, and is an amateur DJ in her spare time. What? <laughs> yes. Very cool. Okay, Brittany, tell us a little bit about Grace. Um, well, I've known Grace for a while. So just like just in general, she's like an amazing person. An amazing writer, but um, I guess you know on paper. Listen, I'm just trying to keep up with you, but like, honestly, no, honestly, we're just this is this is us right now. Um, but Grace is a New York Times best-selling comic book writer, best known for her work on Number Jane, and she once spent um, a year attending ten high school productions of Mamma Mia. Yes, Mamma Mia, Mamma. I can't reach it. It's okay. Mama no, Mia. Honestly, I've never anyone from Mama Mia. I have learned. I think that is a panel that we need to have just dedicated to yeah. telling us all about that experience. I mm -hmm. I could fill several panels with <laughs> Okay, so let's start out by talking about Lois Lane. Were you both always fans of Lois? Had you heard of her before? What what brought you to this particular story for DC? you want to start, Brittany? Mm, okay. Um, I guess I have been a fan for a long time. I don't know if anyone remembers the ABC series, uh, The New Adventures of Lois and Clark. Um, like, I was obsessed with her on that series. And, and then in the animated series, the Superman animated series, I was in love with that. And I guess sometime... Um, after college, I rediscovered the Superman animated series, and I was just like, you know, it'd be it would be really fun to just draw Lois, just like see what I could do with her. And I just started drawing all of this fan art, and it just kind of got a little obsessive and took off from there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I guess that's the beginning. I've basically known these characters, especially Lois Lane, for a very, very long time. Fantastic. Grace Very and embarrassing long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I went to journalism school um, and kind of, okay, I was not a good journalist because it's so much easier to make something up. Um, I just didn't have the right work ethic. It's very hard to be a journalist. Um, so I was looking into uh, fictional journalists and just like became very obsessed with Lois Lane because she's such a good journalist that first of all, journalism is her superpower. And second of all, she's such an incredible person that she's the, the human that uh, Superman looks to for like, it, she's his hero, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's just incredible. I, I love Lois Lane. And like the idea of doing a middle grade book where it's 
Lois without Clark, where you can really mm-hmm. like dig into Lois specifically um, without any of the the Superman baggage. It's I mean, it was it was a dream come true, truly. So let's Agreed. talk about that a little more. Um, where did you draw your inspiration from? Because you're 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 giving us a story of Lois pre Superman, pre Clark. Um, were you drawing on your own experiences as a kid? How did you sort of reimagine her? Oh, well, okay. So I was thinking about my experiences as a kid and summer. I mean, the the story takes place over the summer of the first week of summer. Um, mm-hmm. And which is just like such a magical time that I remember specifically because it's it feels like even though you know it's going to end eventually, it feels like it won't end. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a combination of that and thinking about um, Brittany's art style and how good you are at drawing expressions, especially very funny expressions. So I knew that like if we took Lois and just cranked up everything we already know about Lois, where would we land? And we've landed on someone who's just like, she's very funny and very, um, she's really, she's just a wild, wild child. Um, she's a steamroller, she's very passionate. I, I love her, I love where we landed. Okay, great. Now we're going to play a little game to test you both to see how well you know your own book. I'm gonna ask some rapid fire questions. When you know the answer, yell out your own name. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm so nervous. Okay, ready. What are the names of the two different bike shops in town? Grace, okay. Grace. It's, <laughs> okay, it's, it's real fun and Cyclone bikes. Yes. Yes. You. Okay. I'm terrible at this kind of thing. Oh, <laughs> what is the name of Lois's sure to go viral social media channel? Uh, oh, uh, I know this. I know. Wait, I'm cheating. I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, uh, it's on VidMe. Wait, I'm cheating. Is it, okay. Is it, oh, it's okay. It's a team effort now. Uh huh. Um, Lois. Is it, is it Lois? Camera action. It is yes. Yes. camera okay. <laughs> filmed on the website Vidney. Yes. I can remember yes. that, but my mind oh, was it just said right. <laughs> <laughs> Which social media influencer starts the friendship challenge? Oh, that's Lottie Live. You didn't uh-huh. see your name. Oh, <laughs> Brittany, you can see Brittany. Brittany. <laughs> Brittany. Lottie Live. You that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got that. <laughs> Okay, where is Kristen supposed to go to sleepaway camp? Um, the name of the camp. Um, Grace. Okay, we it added was a really good pun. We added it was a really was good it pun. Camp Evening Star. Camp Evening it? Star is correct. Yes. Okay, we added that in very late, so I do. <laughs> have, oh boy, these are much harder than I would like. Oh, I know, I was like, I'm gonna win this. I'm gonna oh, win this. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, right? <laughs> it might be a trick question, so let's see. Who is the world's greatest detective? Lois, oh, oh, uh, uh, Brittany. 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 <laughs> um, uh, Batman, I guess in regards to the story. Not the comic, no, the no, comic? no, no, no. Oh, Grace for the Grace. steal? It's Lois Lane. <laughs> It's Batman Lois. is the greatest actor, Lois. That's right, Batman is the second greatest. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Good team effort. I just okay. remember drawing the comic, and I was like, wait, mm-hmm. Batman. Oh, the comic <laughs> is so Oh, my God. It came out great. So we, ha- we have to wrap up. Um, so we have time for just two quick closing questions. The first is, how have you both been staying creative during this time of quarantine? Um, I've been going to all of the metro parks. There are 21 metro parks in Columbus, Ohio, and we've been going to all of them. Great. Yep. Um, I've been doing like these, like, um, just in my car, just these random road trips, just riding around LA, just looking at things I've never seen before. So it's, it's, it's interesting. That's great. Like, and it's really fun. It's interesting. If you were to recommend a book to uh, the readership watching this right now, what book would you recommend for them? Um, I want to recommend, this might be a little old, but I'm going to recommend Harley Quinn Breaking Glass by Mariko Tamaki and Steve Pugh. It's fantastic. I know we're trying to wrap up. It's great. Yes, love it. What do you think, Brittany? Um, Well, just because I just finished this one and it was fun and it's another 
story with friendship in the title of Betty and Veronica Friendship Challenge. I think it's right down the same um, lane of, you know, friendship stories. And what, is it, what is it called, Brittany? Oh, it's Betty and Veronica. Um, did I say Friendship Challenge? You did. Did I, did I just did I just combine the titles? Yeah, but it's Friendship something. Wait. It's, yeah, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for being here. This is great. Um, Lois Lane Let's of the Google Future. Betty and Veronica. It's Betty and Veronica. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Lois Lane and the Friendship Challenge goes on sale August 11th, but you can pre-order now everywhere books are sold. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Brittany. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much to Grace Ellis and Brittany Williams. You can read a free preview of Lois Lane and the Friendship Challenge, along with some of our other middle grade graphic novels through our brand new partnership with Caribou. Check us out on the Caribou app. Next up, we have our YA graphic novel panel where we will be talking about Swamp Thing. Our DC graphic novels feature original out of continuity stories by world-class authors and artists that explore intimate moments, coming of age events in the lives of our characters before they become the superheroes you know and love, such as Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and all the rest. But even if you're not a fan of superhero stories, you will love these grounded, intimate tales that explore the inner lives of these fascinating characters. Our current lineup includes uh, books such as Wonder Woman, Tempest Toss by Laurie Hulse Anderson and Layla Del Duca, Teen Titans Raven by Cami Garcia and Gabriel Piccolo, Gotham High by Melissa De La Cruz and Thomas Patilli, and Mira Tidebreaker by Danielle Page and Stephen Byrne, just to name a few. Today, we're here to talk about one of DC's most exciting projects debuting this fall, Swamp Thing Twin Branches. The story is written by Maggie Stiefvater and illustrated by Morgan Beam. And we are so lucky to have both Morgan and Maggie here today to give us a preview of this fantastic book. Hello. Hey guys. <laughs> okay, Maggie, why don't you tell us a little bit about Morgan? Okay, so I know like five things about Morgan. I might know more than five things about Morgan, but these are five off the top of my head. So you have to like gong me if I do it wrong. You went to SCAD. Yes. Okay, see, that's one. <laughs> you like whiskey. Yes. Donuts. That too. You live in Denver. <laughs> yes, also true. You were very influenced by Sailor Moon. Yeah. Dang, man. <laughs> I I love it. Five things about Morgan Bean. Good. <laughs> okay, Morgan, why don't you tell us what you know about Maggie? Um, well, I would like our viewers to know that Maggie is like possibly the coolest person ever. Um, <laughs> he's not only a New York Times bestselling author, um, best known for such series as the Shiver Trilogy and the Raven Cycle, which I cannot ever. I mean, just Tumblr and Twitter and everybody is so beyond in love with the Raven Cycle. Um, and then also the Scorpio races, which is my personal favorite. Uh, oh, my friend forever. It's my favorite too. <laughs> I love that one. Um, Maggie is also a car aficionado, which is awesome, um, which was going to be my cool fact until uh, earlier as we were all chatting, we learned about Maggie's amazing collection of silky fainting goats. Yeah. Um, which is like, I feel like we could just spend the whole panel talking about that. They're fine. cooler than I am on every single level. <laughs> okay, so why don't you tell us um, a little bit about Swamp Thing? Did you know anything about that character before coming to DC? Were you a fan? Um, for me, Swamp Thing was appealing because one of the things that I touch upon in all of my novels is kind of that um, confluence of science and magic, of reality and like speculative fiction. I always want any kind of genre element to be talking about the real world too, like making it more heightened. And the thing I love about Alec Holland from Swamp Thing is that he's always been really into the natural world and I'm really into the natural world. So I thought that for the age that he was, that it would be really cool to look at someone coming of age alongside like biology and plants and feeling out of place and plants are nothing like us. And so he relates more to plants. Yeah. So that was really where I first connected with Alec. Um, I've been a fan of something for a long time. I have like a, a, a deep, deep love of things that are like kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I love about Swamp Thing is that, you know, he is a hero. He is this champion for the natural world that I feel like right now 
is really important. Um, but he's not your classic hero, you know, he's not the like chiseled, caped, sort of PR ready um, person who's out there, you know, punching criminals or whatnot. Um, you know, he is uh, very much a thing from the shadows, you know, somebody whose body has been mutated, somebody who upon you know, just looking at him, you would think monster instead of hero. And I just think that that dynamic and kind of dealing with like that dark side of of doing good is is really compelling story wise. Um, and then, you know, if you're for those of you watching who are familiar with Maggie's writing, I do feel like that also that was like such a strong character choice just because of how much that kind of I don't know, kind of creepy fantasy, dark underbelly um, comes out so well in Maggie's writing. So knowing that that would be the paired project, I was really excited about it. Do so, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the plant life. Um, Maggie, you mentioned that a little bit. And, and as the story sort of begins to descend into um, Alex's transform transformation, we see that reflected in the plant life. So the plant life is almost like a character in and of itself. How did you both work together to really make that part of it um, mirror what was going on internally within Alex? First of all, I'm so sad that my camera is turned around this way instead of the other way because my office has no joke 45 plants in the other <laughs> side of it. There's plants everywhere. Um, so the thing that I really wanted to talk about with plants in this book is I wanted to talk about the way that Alec really feels a kinship with them instead of people. And as an introvert myself, and I'm sure Morgan as an introvert, I mean, we can all kind of relate to this idea that you're out there doing your thing and no one else is anything like you. And whatever comes out of your mouth is wrong. Everything that's true about you is unspoken. And I really wanted to roll that into it. And at the same time, I was actually also losing my mind. I didn't realize it at the time, but I uh, did after I collapsed on a book tour and had to be taken off the road, my body was no longer making any cortisol. My adrenal glands were completely done. And one of the symptoms of it that was slowly leading up to it was that I was slowly losing the ability to remember things. And I was slowly losing the ability to speak out loud. People would come to my house and they'd say, I have a package for Maggie Steve Otter. Is this your address? And I would say, no, there's no one here who lives with that name, I don't, I don't know. And so this sense of trying to write while I was also literally unable to put thoughts together, I started doing lots and lots of research before I found out what was wrong with me about what our thoughts really are. And what I found was that we actually have a ton in common with plants. They use a ton of the same neurotransmitters that we use. When you look at the very basic cellular level, we're kind of, sort of, very similar. And I thought, I really want to make people feel that when they're reading Alec, that Alec gets them on this level. And one of the things that I love about Morgan's art is that I said, could we just have like a plant in every single scene? There's just always something growing into there, being part of it. And every single panel, if you look at this, is just alive with plants. And so it feels like Alec and plants, they're always the same for the entire thing, even before he has this descent into, what am I really a human plant? Is there a difference between them? That's um. great. Um, for me, I guess on the visual side, one of the really interesting things about, you know, plants and kind of plant human connection is that we use things like um, flowers, for example, in pretty much most emotional or transitional points of life, right? Like you give flowers to express love, you give plants to express grief, um, you kind of use them as this as this profound symbolism to convey things that maybe you can't find the words to say. Um, and so plants and plant life is, is sort of like just rife with emotional symbolism, which is like so great for the emotion, for the, you know, visual storytelling medium we do. You know, thorns are angry and certain things are lush. Um, and so I just really wanted to kind of push, um, you know, where we could use plant lives to further enforce the emotions that the reader was going to experience with this book, which is, I feel like, a really kind of cool, unique thing that only comics can do, right? Because you're giving a visual, but it doesn't have to be, you know, the actual thing that's in the shot or the thing that's timed. Um, and so I just felt like that was a really cool avenue for us to explore the connection between this main character and how he felt about plants, but also plants just to make the reader feel stronger things. Fantastic. Um, we are going to play a very quick game. Great, I love games. How well do you know your book? And I want you to answer as quickly as possible. When you have an answer ready, just say your own name, and we will go to you for an answer. OK, ready? This game, yeah. Ready. <laughs> <You scared? laughs> what is Alex's plant name at the beginning of the book, the name and number? Oh, Maggie, Boris, 73. 
That is correct. You know, I, actually, Camaro was in 1973. Is Camaro and Boris I have 74. Huh? Is it Boris 73 or 74? Isn't he 74 at the end? 73 I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh, okay. at the end of it. <laughs> Where is think, Alex submitting his research? To what school? <laughs> um, UC Berkeley. Morgan, UC Berkeley. That's correct. You what had to do the lettering on that thing, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what are Dalton and Jolie's dogs' names? Oh, uh, Maggie. Is it Gallon? Gallon barrel? and Barrel. Gallon and Barrel. You know, I'm not going to be able to remember my phone number when I'm old and I'll have that fact in there some, <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Why is Gross's nickname Gross? Oh, oh it's a math joke because he's. Uh, name. Oh, sorry. Morgan. <laughs> it's okay. a math joke because of his age, but I'm also bad at math, so now I can't remember exactly what it is because he's 12. He's 144 months old. Right. Okay, <laughs> last one. What is the legend of the Hollington sisters? Like Maggie, like, one of them ran away, right? Oh my gosh. Maybe and left no behind way. the sister because the one was in love with the sister's fiance and buried the secret underneath that tree, which yeah. has an amazing panel where something spoilery and bad happens to it, which well done, Morgan, <laughs> was very traumatized. <laughs> Very good. Okay, we need to wrap up. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of quick closing questions. The first is, how are you staying creative during quarantine? Do you want to go first, Morgan? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, in all honesty, that's it's been a struggle for me. Um, I live, uh, actually, my husband is a fellow comic artist. Um, and we had an outside studio, which was like my heart with, with uh, four other professional comic artists, which was really good for my productivity and motivation. And since moving back into our apartment, it has been a little bit of a struggle, um, but definitely kind of social distance park meeting up with those guys, um, being able to kind of sneak peek bits of projects that they're working hard on and whatnot, um, definitely kind of inspires me to stay creative and kind of get my act together, but it's been hard. <laughs> I have to admit for me, I really, I miss the aspect of getting out there and doing like the automotive journalism stuff and everything I've been doing, being out there on the road, but I am definitely like living the life of being the hermit, shutting myself in a tree. And I've been writing loads of books. I play like seven musical instruments. So I've been practicing all of those. I've been up in my art studio. I just finished filming like an eight hour writing seminar. I'm getting so much stuff done. And I feel terrible about it because everyone else is like, this is awful. I'm like, my superpower is being extremely <laughs> introverted. <laughs> So yeah, I've been keeping very busy. It's going to be terrible when they sit me out into the world. I'm so good at distracting myself out in the world and not getting work done. I just go out there with my hair on fire. And, yeah. <laughs> that is great. And um, really quickly, what would be um, a book that you would recommend to anyone in the audience watching you right now? Oh, I have a stack. I brought that, so I wouldn't forget that. No. Before you read Swamp Thing, you can read Brilliant Green, which is about the secret life of plants. You should also read The Hidden Life of Trees, which is about the secret life of trees. Bad things happen to trees in our book. And finally, you should read The Body Electric, which is about really cool things that electrical impulses do inside our body and also about what happens when you take an arm off a salamander and make a, like a hand grow there instead. It's kind of gross and cool. <laughs> My recommendation actually which doesn't have to do with our book, sadly, but it's just one of my all time favorite comics is a DC Vertigo book uh, that's called Day Tripper. Um, and it's just one of those comics that I think is such an exemplary uh, example <laughs> great, um, of what uh, comics as a medium can really do um, and how it can convey an emotional story kind of uniquely from all other media. So that one is super good. It's definitely it's a little sad. Be prepared to cry a little bit, um, but it's a really good comic. And it's really beautiful too. It's, it's great. Really beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, Swamp Thing Twin Branches goes on sale October 13th, just in time for Halloween. But you can pre order it now wherever books are sold. Thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you so much, Maggie. And thank you for coming. Thanks. thanks guys. Hey, it's Jim again. Thank you for tuning in. DC at Home Day One comes to a conclusion. 
you guys want to follow more things about DC, you can check out dccomics.com. That's our URL. Or you can check out our socials on Instagram and Twitter at DC Comics or at the DC Nation. Tune in tomorrow, 11 a.m. Pacific time for day two of DC at home. See you then.